My friend John was once in a D&D game that the dungeon master Michael claimed was a sandbox game. Players were free to explore the world as the group desired, go on the adventures they wanted to, pursue character goals, such as becoming a lich, which is what John's wizard really wanted to do. Well, the works. Do whatever you want. The campaign was pitched as ultimate freedom to do what they wanted. So yeah, who, would it, who wouldn't be on board with that sort of thing? I mean, it sounds like tons of fun, doesn't it? The campaign started okay. They were in a tavern, there was a bar fight, they spent the night in jail, but they interrogated the crap out of a cellmate and found out about a powerful magic sword guarded by borrow whites. So once they were released, they set off to slaughter some whites and collect some sweet, sweet loot. However, as that adventure progressed and then later on in the campaign, it became apparent to John that the dungeon master was essentially just pulling everything out of his butt as the game went along. That is, he wasn't really planning anything in advance, he was just making everything up on the fly. Now, John's not dumb. He knows that a good part of being a dungeon master is improvising because players often take left turns at Albuquerque. However, there were so many times that the players made their intentions clear and Michael could have prepped an adventure out of it if he'd wanted to. He just, for some reason, did it. Because here's the thing, this wasn't John's first D&D campaign as a player. His previous game was with a different dungeon master, Samantha, who ran an amazing game. And John knew from talking with Samantha that she was a meticulous planner and took the time outside the game to ensure that her adventures were tight. Tight, 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 tight. Sorry, for those who know that reference, you know that reference. Now this isn't to say that the sandbox game that John was in was bad exactly. There were certainly fun parts to it. However, he couldn't help but notice the night and day difference between Michael's game and Samantha's. The more he thought about it, the more he preferred Samantha's game style. Sure, the players didn't have as much freedom exactly, but the game was a heck of a lot more fun. It also was more packed full of action because the group didn't have to wait around for the DM to look things up or quickly plan an encounter on the fly. They spent more time actually playing the game and that was huge. Of course, this got John to thinking. Why couldn't his current dungeon master stick with running a sandbox game style, but also take the time to prep out the adventures more instead of just making everything up on the fly? Wouldn't that capitalize on the best of both worlds? I mean, would that be too much to ask? Now, John's observations are completely on the mark, and they in fact underscore a common misconception out there that running a sandbox game means planning nothing and making everything up on the fly in response to character actions. Nothing could be further from the truth. So today we're gonna to be discussing how to run a sandbox game in a way that both gives your players the freedom to pursue things that interest them, but also helps the dungeon master take advantage of the power of preparing content in advance. Before we jump in, if you run fifth edition games and are looking for professionally developed DM resources you can use in your campaigns, you need to check out our Layers and Legends 2 Kickstarter. It is live now and kicking butt. These two books, Layers and Legends 2 and Loot and Lore 2, are the ultimate game master resource. You're gonna get an anthology of everything you need to run amazing games for years to come at your fingertips. Over 30 adventures, 30 standalone encounters, more than 100 monsters, six new rule sets, puzzles, traps, and more. These books are written to make running the game easy for both new and veteran GMs. Each resource is built with intuitive formatting, clear wording, and evocative art. You'll never again have to dig through dense paragraphs to find critical details you need during a live session. Now, you can get PDFs, hardcovers, the Foundry VTT pack, and even limited edition alt covers that will never be printed again. Look how beautiful these bad boys are. I'm telling you, you do not want to miss Layers and Legends 2. There is, of course, a link down below where you can learn more and back the project. What does it take to run a sandbox? Now, there are arguably many ways to run a sandbox campaign, but there are some common things that all good sandbox games share in common. Since there isn't usually a planned story or GM direction to the sandbox, that is, the player's characters have tons of freedom to do what they want when they want, a common misconception is that a sandbox game takes less prep time than a more linear adventure. However, that isn't exactly true. A good sandbox campaign properly run will take at least as much prep as a more linear game, if not more. And why is that, you might ask? 
Well, there are two reasons. First, one of the things that defines a campaign is that there is a story through line. This is the ongoing continuous story that makes the players feel like the adventures and scenes in the game are all part of a larger ongoing narrative. And let me tell you, creating that feeling in a sandbox campaign can be extremely difficult and take quite a bit of effort. The second reason is that in a good sandbox campaign, the dungeon master isn't just making everything up on the fly. No they're still preparing adventures, encounters, and the like in advance of the game session. However, there is a special caveat to that, which can make it a bit more challenging, but we're gonna get into that in just a little bit. Finally, so that we can be completely clear on this point, a sandbox game that consists of the dungeon master winging it and making everything up on the fly is most assuredly going to result in a less engaging game and could also result in a directionless game. This is the game where the players don't really know what they should do and they just sort of wander around, stirring up trouble wherever they can find it. Dungeon Masters often complain about murder hobo players, but sometimes it's our own darn fault. Okay, so what are the steps in creating a sandbox campaign? Step number one, determine the campaign structure. Your first step in designing a sandbox campaign is deciding the structure of your campaign. For instance, will there be clear, obvious plot hooks being delivered to the players and then they'll need to make choices? Or will you be using more points of interest in your campaign or straight up running a hex crawl? Will your campaign be centered around a single home base or will it involve the characters traveling the breadth of the continent? What will the tone of the campaign be? Epic adventure, dark fantasy, sword and sorcery, light and comedic? Determining the tone is important to almost all the prep work you're going to be doing. By the way, if you want to learn more about using points of interest or running hex crawls in your game, I do have a couple of videos on those topics. I will toss links to them down in the description for you. The one type of campaign structure you probably do not want to follow, however, is that of plopping the characters down in a location without any hooks without anything planned and just expect them to figure things out. That is probably gonna be a massive flop unless you've specifically discussed running a West Marches style of campaign with your players and they're all on board with that. Of course, in that case, your campaign structure is gonna look more like this. One, the players decide what their goals are and what they want to do as a group. Two, the dungeon master prepares the adventure between game sessions. Three. The group convenes to run the adventure that the DM prepared for them based on their goals. You see, you're still not just pulling things out of your butt, you're still preparing stuff for the group to run. Step number two, create the home base or originating location. Your next step to running a sandbox campaign is to create the home base. That is the town or city where the characters will start the game and where most of the campaign will take place or the originating location. This is where the PCs begin the game, but where they will only stay for a limited period of time before moving on to more other locales. To get started, ask yourself, Will the central or originating location be a stronghold, town, city, or something else? Now, most of these locations are static, but the idea of a mobile base, like a carnival, is completely valid and could be tons of fun. It gives your players something familiar to return to, but the environment around them is also constantly changing, which staves off boredom. Whatever the central location is, you should also develop the key NPCs, usually reoccurring ones, that will provide support to the characters. These are the blacksmiths, the jewel buyers, the magic shop, and the like. Bear in mind that the NPCs should be engaging. You want the NPCs to make the game world more fun, not more mundane. Ideally, you want the players to come to like these NPCs for whatever reason, be it a silly voice, over the top expressions or whatever, and develop an attachment to them. If the characters don't have an attachment to these NPCs, a reason to like them and enjoy having them in the game, the NPCs fall flat and don't contribute meaningfully to the enjoyability of the game and don't give the characters a reason to even go home. Finally, if the players don't care about the NPCs, you can't threaten them or 
kill them in order to motivate the characters. I mean, you could, but the players will just be like, whatever, just kill the blacksmith, like nobody cares. Not that any respectable game master would ever threaten someone a character holds dear to provide drama and excitement in the game. No, we would never do that. Whenever possible, it is always a good idea with a sandbox to have something familiar and interesting for the characters to return to, be it the location or the NPCs inhabiting it. Step number three, develop the surrounding world. First, make or find a map. The map doesn't have to be an entire world. It just needs to be a couple days journey around the home base or originating location. That's it. That's all that's really necessary at first. Naturally, the player should receive a version of this map, though it shouldn't include all the private GM markup information that your version is likely going to have on it. Only place information on the map that you think the character would reasonably know. Everything else should be a mystery to them until they discover it for themselves. Along that train of thought, sandbox campaigns work best in a world that is not fully explored, or at least one with plenty of locations to explore and adventure in. Part of the excitement of many sandbox games is not just doing the things that you want to do, but also going to unique and interesting locales where you might explore and discover something cool. As with most things related to GM prep, create only what you need to create. This saves you tons of time and unnecessary work. Here are some quick fire things to consider when fleshing out the surrounding world. Factions politics, the populace's attitude toward adventurers, the local economy, and places that support adventurers, blacksmiths, weaponsmiths, alchemists, healers, and the like. Now, if you wanna learn more about world building, I suggest you check out my video on the supreme world building method at the link below. By the way, if you're not sure what you will need, the best place to look for this information is the characters themselves. A cleric PC needs a god or a pantheon and probably some local churches or temples. A wizard may need a library or guild where he can learn new spells. A warrior will need a place to buy weapons and armor and perhaps some trainers. Once the campaign starts, you can always create more of the surrounding world as you go. Don't fall into the trap of delaying your campaign from starting for months or years because you need to flesh out everything in the world first. I mean, if you just want to world build, that's but if you want to run D&D or Pathfinder 2 or Dungeon Crawl Classic, keep world building to what's absolutely needed so you can, you know, actually play the game. And there's nothing wrong, of course, with, you know, beginning to play the game once you have what you need and then continue your world building efforts simultaneously. Like, I understand and totally respect that lots of game masters love the world building part of things. All I'm saying is don't let it stop your game from beginning. By the way, if you're finding this information useful, please give me a thumbs up and leave a comment down below letting me know that I don't completely suck. I mean, I, I have a very fragile sense of self-esteem. You know, leave me a comment, please. Step four, create some plot hooks. Remember that we are not just dropping our characters into the world with Thing to do. It is your job as the game master to create interesting problems, conflicts, and situations in the world that will inspire the player's characters to go off on adventures. To that end, you want to create a handful of plot hooks for the characters to discover as they start playing. A plot hook is in essence presenting the characters with a problem that needs to be resolved. The Duke's daughter is getting married, but this or that nobleman has been sabotaging the wedding preparations. The Duke's daughter was going to get married, but assassins killed the groom. The Duke is dead, the daughter is dead, and now the region is in complete turmoil. Whatever. Pick your poison and pick several of them. You then take these three or four plot hooks that you created and present them to your player's characters. They could be rumors they hear at an inn, wanted posters in the town square, or literal NPC quest givers that approach them and ask for help. One way or another, make sure they get the plot hooks. Remember, a good plot hook does three things. First, it clearly explains what the problem is. Second, it has something that will motivate the players and or characters to do the thing. That is a reward of some sort, be it gold pieces, a magic item, or just the knowledge that they are doing the right thing. Finally, it should tell them where or how to get started. You know, so they aren't just wandering around randomly. Gee, we, we, we know we need to find the groom's assassins, but where do we start? I guess we just start wandering around the city. Which actually would 
work if it were like a mystery adventure and part of the adventure is discovering the clues and stuff. So maybe that would work in certain circumstances, I guess. But you're still gonna present clues to them, aren't you? Yes, you are. Indeed you are, because that's part of a mystery adventure. Ta-da! Anyway, moving on. By the way, too many plot hook options can cause analysis paralysis and make deciding what to do a real pain. Three to four plot hooks or adventuring locations are plenty of options to give players. Two options make it look like there are rather no options, five or more, and it starts to drag down the decision-making process. Furthermore, do not give the players plot hooks for places you don't want them to go or things you don't want them to do. This may seem like common sense, but I think we're missing a little bit of that these days and it is an easy trap to fall into. I was once running a Curse of Strahd campaign and I was tossing out plot hooks like they were candy. My ring just went across the room. My rings are all falling off. I think this one almost fell off and the other one literally fell off. Anyway, I'm throwing out plot hooks like they're candy with many of them for places that were designed for much higher levels than my players were. Now, my players were veterans and knew better than to go to Castle Ravenloft at level two, but not all groups will benefit from this knowledge. And for a homebrew sandbox campaign, they would have no clue that the swamp of eternal dread that you mentioned is way too dangerous for them quite yet. Of course, the swamp of eternal dread is kind of like, whoa, that's level 20, right? You'd be surprised. Anyway, don't mention the swamp until you're ready for them to go there, right? Okay, so once your players have the plot hooks, they simply choose the one that interests them the most, and that's the thing they go off and do. Ideally, your players will tell you this toward the end of a game session or by email or something else so that you can create the adventures away from the table because, well, you're probably not going to create three to four full-blown adventures up front before even knowing what they're going to do. I mean, you you could, but while that would be like tons of work and many of the adventurers would never get used. I mean, technically you could probably scale them up as you go as needed, which isn't that hard, but it is a little bit extra effort and then you might have to swap out enemies and stuff. So nah, better not do it if you don't have to. Step five, create some adventures. Now that you've presented your players with a list of plot hooks and they've chosen the one they want to do, you simply have to plan that adventure and then you run it together as a group. However, what do you do when the campaign starts? Presenting plot hooks and planning adventures between sessions works great once the campaign is in full swing, but what do you do at your first game session? Simple. Since you don't know what your players will do that first session, it's a good idea to create plot hooks that represent short, simple adventures. That way you can literally have all three or four adventures ready to go. And then no matter what the players decide to do, you're ready. By the way, the five room dungeon concept works great for these early sandbox adventures. However, I wouldn't recommend it for your regular adventures that you're gonna run through the rest of your campaign. Now, a great strategy for integrating future plot hooks into your campaign is by placing them in the adventures themselves. They might find an evil priest's journal that mentions a crypt full of treasure, or they might find a letter from one bad guy or another. Having characters organically discover plot hooks in adventures is a great game design approach. And and avoids having to rely upon the overused NPC quest giver strategy. Anyone who's played World of Warcraft knows what an NPC quest giver is. They have like an exclamation point above their head or a question mark or something, you know. <laughs> you know what they are. Hello, good sir, tell me what I should do. Get five of these or kill five of these or kill these creatures which have a low chance of dropping these things which you need to get five of and then bring them back to me. Yes, good sir, I shall go off now and do my quest. Can you see why I got bored with World of Warcraft very fast? <laughs> I got to like level 80 or whatever and I asked my brother who was really into it. I was like, yo bro, I'm at level 80, what do I do now? And he's like, go on dungeons, you know, these mega dungeons, these raids, right? Go on raids. And I was like, okay, what am I doing in raids? He's like, you're getting more powerful weapons and stuff. Okay, what am I getting more powerful weapons and stuff for? 
so you can do the next level difficulty of the raid or go, lo or go longer in the raid because you're more powerful. I'm like, why would I? What kind of hamster wheel are you trying to talk me into, man? <laughs> and then I was pretty much done at that point. <laughs> anyway, tangent aside, as you're making future plot hooks, do your best to develop them based on what has already occurred in the campaign. This helps you create that story through line that will give players the sense of a continuous story or narrative unfolding as they play the game. Of course, there is nothing to stop you from running the sort of campaign where players' characters pursue their own goals and interests. As long as they tell you in advance so that you can prepare adventures for them, that could work just as fine for a sandbox campaign. Just as fine or just fine? Just fine. I am a professional YouTuber talkie person and it's... I tell you, it's hard at times, it really is. <laughs> you could even run a mix where you give them some plot hooks, which they sometimes follow, but other times they pursue their own goals. Now, part of building adventures is creating villains. And something I want to mention here is that villains should be proactive. Villains need to have ambition and plans that draw the characters in. Villains that just sit in their dungeons and wait for the characters to come and get them are boring. No, 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 no. Villains should be out in the world doing villainous stuff. They should be committing evil deeds that the characters will hear about in the inn while they're grabbing a drink. They should be sacking villages, stealing sheep. I don't know, the, the stuff bad guys usually do. I think they steal sheep. I would steal sheep because then you could like make wool blankets. These activities will then be the hooks that draw characters in and lead them to them, lead, lead them to the villains. I still want, I like wool blankets. I, I don't know what it is, but I have this wool blanket that's really nice and I like it a lot. And my wife took it and washed it. And now I don't have a wool blanket on my bed. And I'm, I'm still upset about that. I'm gonna have to go, I think it's dry by now. I'm gonna have to go get that. Okay, I'll be right back. Finally, in a sandbox campaign, it's critical that characters' actions have consequences for good or ill. This helps develop the story of the campaign in your game world. This means that as the characters are doing things, you should be asking yourself, how would this affect the world around the characters? And then you use that information to develop your next plot hook or point of interest. For instance, if the characters manage to rescue the dragon from the evil princess, but all of the dragon's eggs are broken in the process, what would happen as a result? Will the dragon hold that against the characters, possibly striking back at the character's own family members? Will the evil princess laud the characters as heroes and offer them a job? Allowing character actions to cause a ripple effect in your game world is amazingly satisfying for players and can take your game to the next level. By the way, if you need help creating adventures, I have tons of adventure creation videos on my channel that can help. I will throw a link to my adventure creation playlist down below. And we also have an adventure creation template over on the DM Layer store that you can pick up for free that will help guide you through some of the different parts of making an adventure. Step number six, track time. Adventures don't just sit around waiting for the characters. In my Thieves Abound Pathfinder 2 campaign, there is a job board in Frostmantle where the characters can pick adventures from it if they want to. However, the same jobs aren't there forever. If they go off and do this, that, or the other dungeon and then return a month later, the chances are most of those jobs are gone. Either other adventurers have taken care of things or the situation has gotten even worse and things have evolved. You see, time is another great generator of consequences that lead to the feeling of a living, breathing world and help the group create a campaign story. Number seven, develop a random encounter table or two. As in any type of D&D game, having random encounters in a sandbox campaign helps flesh out the world and allows fun little surprises to find the characters. Having random encounters handy also helps you fill in gaps in the game session. Now, I wouldn't have every encounter on a table be exactly for the character's level. Remember, it's perfectly okay to introduce creatures that the character should avoid or run from as well as things they can easily confront and overcome. And in a similar vein, not everything should be a combat encounter. Some things should just be occurrences or events that happen while they're traveling around. If you take a look at the point of interest system that my team and I published, you'll see that a lot of the points of interest that you might encounter in the world have nothing to do with combat. Step eight, be prepared to improvise. Now, the fact of the matter is that no matter how much you prep, you're going to have to improvise in your sandbox campaign. So to learn about the 15 
improv mistakes everyone makes and how to become a better improviser, check out this video right here. Also, don't forget to back our Layers and Legends 2 Kickstarter and get your hands on these beautiful limited edition alt covers filled with top-notch 5e Game Master resources. And until next time, happy game mastering.